Good afternoon. In the next 20 minutes or so, I want to talk about something that we've been working on at NIME for quite some time now, which we term integrated deployment. That's really an integrated, completely automated way of moving data science into production. In order to do this, I want to spend a bit of time to look at this more from a conceptual point and compare cooking and data science to each other. On the cooking side, you have a chef that's creating a new recipe. He's trying new ingredients, he's experimenting with quantities and cooking styles, and tries to come up with something, and after a while he tastes it, he tries it out with the stuff maybe, and he's happy with the resulting recipe. He then puts that recipe in his new book, and the book is then used by millions of home cooks once a month to prepare meals at home. And then every two years or so, or every three years, a new edition is prepared that has revised recipes and new recipe or two. This is actually very similar to data science, where we have a data scientist or a team of data scientists that are working on a new analysis. They're trying to come up with a new predictive model for engine failures or for customer churn, or trying to generate other types of insights into their day-to-day -day business. They're integrating new data sources, they're experimenting with different models, and they tune parameters, they try out the newest bleeding edge technology that was just published in the academic world. Once satisfied, they put that optimized model into production where it's then used on a daily basis by business analysts trying to come up with predictions or trying to understand better what's going on in the business. And then usually often on a daily basis or so, there's feedbacks, right? There are new requirements, new technologies that people want to try out. So we need to be able to very frequently on an almost daily basis, put new updated models into production. The real problem on the cooking side is there's a gigantic technology break. On the cooking side, we have this experimental kitchen of Chef Michael. There's tons of different things to do. He has professional steaming engines and whatever, which is not available at a normal home cuisine, right? So people need to be able, the moment when we translate my recipe that I invented in my experimental kitchen to something that millions of home people, people at home can actually use, I need to be able to sort of translate this down so it can be implemented on different types of technologies, maybe just two pots, no steamer, just one pan, normal kitchen knives, that type of stuff. It's possible to do that because I have to do this once every couple of years so I can spend a bit of time and there's sort of, there's not that much new technology coming out in the kitchen world on a daily basis. This is very different on the data science side, of course, because we have daily updates. We need to do this much, much more frequently, which means we can't, always invest a lot of manual labor into translating this. So there really shouldn't be a technology break there. The big problem, however, in data science is that there is a gigantic technology break between the data science development, where people use a mix of tools, they reach out to all sorts of open source libraries, latest, greatest technologies that have been published in the academic community. And the deployment of these models or res results uses often yet another tool. So very often, there's some step in there that requires manual translation. Sometimes you don't need to manually translate this, but you do have a way of exporting a library or exporting some sort of a model representation that you trained, that the data science created. But then very often, the coverage of the technologies that can be used on the creation side is very incomplete to that what you can actually deploy, right? And this is most often is a huge lack of pre-processing and new models that you want to try. So at that point in time, our data scientists team now needs to look into what they came up, what they really believe is the optimal model setup and data pre-processing setup. And they need to sort of kind of boil this down to something that it can actually be deployed, which is a huge problem. And of course, makes for a very long and inefficient cycle. We don't have built-in testing and we really can't fully automate it and complete the deployment, right? which is something we do want to do if we really want to update our models on a daily basis. So let's dive a little bit deeper in how we propose to solve this problem on the NIME side, right? Integrated deployment under the hood, so to speak. A very, very simple, this is creating data science workflow could look like this, right? We have a bit of data blending up here, reading something from a database, blending this with some file. We have a bit of custom data pre-processing. Then we up here in this block, we're doing the model optimization and the training. And once the model is, the parameters are optimized, the model is trained, we can use this model down here for some prediction, right? This is the workflow that has been built by our data scientist team, a very simplified version, of course, um, during the creation phase. What they're deploying is not this workflow, but they're deploying is a workflow that looks more like this, but it has a way of accessing the data, maybe as a REST service, it just 
feeds and data here. We need to copy this custom data preprocessing block down here, so it also gets applied to the data that we're reading in. And then I need to copy the piece about the prediction and maybe even read in the models here, and then I'm spitting out the results, right? So the workflow is kind of a subset of my creation workflow. In reality, what people usually then do is they have this, this is the workflow that I use for creation. I'm running this one. I'm automatically writing out these two models. They get automatically read in here. I need to make sure I have the storage somewhere and just orchestrated and versioned somehow. So I need some extra set around that one. And then this can be deployed. Every time the data scientist is changing something here or is picking a different model here, they need to update the scoring, the production workflow as well, right? So this is extremely cumbersome and always requires manual labor and you constantly need to verify that what you're copying down here is actually the same that the activities that if you miss something on the data pre-processing side you'll very quickly run into problems with your production so it's keeping those two things in sync is a huge problem so the issues here it's really a lot of the etl pieces are manual copies we need to somehow figure out how to transport these models and monitor that that's happening there and some of the pre-processing that's kind of interesting side note here the normalization is really kind of part of the model as well right so I'm training the parameters for this normalization on the training data. I'm extracting that from the training data. And I use, need to use exactly the same parameters also for the application here. So this is an extremely inefficient and error-prone process. But we're doing it now. now. And here's a side note. This is, of course, not just a, an issue with visual workflows. This is a general problem with, uh, with programming. So creating data science, this is a little Python script. The, the code for creating the data science. And on the other side, we have what we put in production. It's not the same code. You're not putting the Python notebook into production. You're putting in production what you have optimized using the Python notebook. So on the NIME side, what we can do a little bit better, what we're proposing to do here is, um, is expanding the workflow for the creation of, of data science over here by adding a couple of nodes. So the pieces that we actually need to use on the production side are the ones that we are now encapsulating in this capture workflow start and capture workflow end nodes. So I'm going to grab this piece, which we need to apply also during production. And I'm also grabbing the piece for the prediction that's actually needed to apply the model to the data during production. These two pieces of the workflow are then combined here and written out. And what this node really does, the workflow writer, what it does, it writes out automatically this production workflow, which looks exactly like the one I showed you before, but now it's not something where I have to manually copy pieces from up here, down here, but it's automatically generated through that node here, right? Has the custom data preprocessing, has the two model readers, the normalization applier, the random forest predictor, and so on. The moment I'm changing the models up here, they will be written out here as well. So there's no manual interaction at all required anymore, but it's automatically generated from this workflow writer here. And of course, this workflow writer can write the workflow somewhere, but it can auto also automatically deploy the workflow as a service, deploy the workflow as an analytics application, or share the workflow with others. So all of the capabilities of the Nine server to track history of workflows also comes in play here. That was an extremely simple example, of course. This creation workflow can be a lot more complex than in reality it will be. It can be guided, it can have interactive components. You can use some of the automation components in our hub for automat automatically learning models or automatically determining feature construction for blending for the learning and so on. And of course, it could also be a workflow that monitors and updates production workflows. And on the other end, the Workflow that I'm putting in production can also be, can be a service. I showed a very sim simple example here, but it could also be an analytics application. So I'm automatically deploying something. I'm changing the web-based application that's accessible by the business analysts. Or it could be something that is monitoring and updating other workflows as well. So what's new? With this type of setups, it's really only a couple of nodes and a lot of, of course, underlying uh, smart things happening on the workflow engine. Um, we can now cover the entire data processing and model functionality. We have zero technology break anymore, right? Anything that a model in a workflow on the creation side can be automatically deployed. We can move this directly into a production environment, right? Because usually just deploying, exporting a library or deploying some sort of code, that's not a tool. You still need to wrap that into something that people or machines can actually use, right? So being able to move that directly into the production environment is a huge plus. 
And of course, the other nice thing is I'm using the data science creation environment directly to generate the production service application because I'm picking the pieces that I actually need there and say, okay, this is a part that needs to be part of the production workflow. This is another piece that also needs to be deployed. Assemble those, put it out. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail by looking at two examples, just to give you a bit of a feeling where this type of integrated deployment can actually be very, very useful. The first example is one where we're talking about custom model monitoring and optimization. Other people call that model ops, right? So we want to have a couple of models in production. They're continuously used maybe every night to score some customer activities. And I want to automatically monitor and retrain many of these models when the performance changes too much. So the workflow here, very simple one, right? I'm reading the data. I'm checking the current workflows that are in production. I monitor what's going on. I allow retraining. I can allow the user some interaction to pick the models that she believes ought to be replaced, and then I automatically deploy. And here, that's the piece where I'm using these workflow writer nodes and automatically upload and replace them for workflows that are currently in production. What does this look like? Let's look at the first node here. This is monitoring the current models. So for this very simple example, we have three three models. One is uh, looking at new customers, one is trying to pick churn, the other one is looking at upsell. We kind of see that somewhere in here something happened, right? The new customer model, its performance really dropped sharply, but also the churn model and the upsell model seem to be declining over time. So the user now can say, well, let's try to retrain all three of these models. They are all not really ideal anymore. Once we do the retraining down here in this node, I can now look again at the retrained models are they in fact better. And I see here the new customer model, is substantially better, we're back to the performance before this drop. Even the churn model shows some improvement, so that's probably also worth deploying as a new model, but the customer upsell model is something that we don't really see in effect, so we may choose not to deploy that, right? So we're deploying these two models, automatically done now with the next node, model deployment here, will override these two workflows, will automatically version them, and we have a, a record of what's going on, and we have the new models in production starting today. No manual interaction required. So here we have a blueprint that's available on the hub that's completely customizable. There's no black box, right? If you want to use different models or different workflows for the scoring underneath the hood, you look at the workflow, you change it there, right? Um, we have workflows. It's all wor a workflow for the model training. There's a workflow for the model monitoring. There's a workflow for the model updating, right? It's all part of the same programming environment, essentially. Any adjustments, adding new models, updating the training algorithm, you can deploy that instantly, right? You don't have to then go back and make sure this is in sync with your production environment, but it gets deployed automatically. The second example I wanted to show is about guided automation, right? This idea of having automated feature selection and model building and being able to break open the black box, not having to rely on some, some vendor giving you access to here's, this is the automated machine learning environment. You don't really know what's going on underneath the hood, and you can't add your favorite models, but you can do that because in the end, it's again just a nice workflow. The workflow is obviously a little bit more complicated. Again, we're doing some data blending here. We're doing a little bit of data preparation that we're capturing so we can deploy that automatically. Then we're looking at we're allowing the user some interaction to figure out which columns he or she wants to include or exclude. Then we train two different models, optimize them, and again, we allow the user to select the models and then drop the right or we're writing out the resulting workflow. What does this look? Just two examples here. So the interactive column filter looks like this one. There's actually a lot more to this one. You can download this workflow from the hub and see it yourself. But this one gives this particular piece of that, that view gives you an overview over different distributions for different columns. So you can pick the ones that has many outliers. Maybe this is interesting. Maybe this triggers some insights into the data already. Or just say, you know, that many outliers are probably not a good idea to include that in the modeling. The most really skewed histogram here is maybe also not a good one to include. So this allows you to essentially check if the automatic detection of good versus bad features is in, is in line with your business understanding. Once you've done that, we are going to try out all of these models and then we are going to show you the model overview. And here it gives you two scoring metrics for diff two different models. You pick one, it allows you to adjust the binary classification thresholds here. And then you can do two things. You can deploy the model automatically so it gets automatically, automatically overrides the model that's in production, or I can also download the model. This is extremely useful for a data scientist who wants to then use this model, this workflow that trains the best model with the features that we selected and the feature preposition that we selected and automatically fine-tuned, and can use that as a starting point for refined analysis. 
So we can deploy this automatically to business users, but we can also use the workflow as a downloadable blueprint, so to speak, to get started for the data scientists themselves. So integrated deployment in a nutshell. Um, zero technology break. This is really the crucial part here, right? The data science development is done using nine workflows. And these nine workflows are designed in such a way that they automatically deploy the models or results as nine workflows again. We have complete coverage. In NIME, we have, you have access, access to over 3,000 nodes, some of these modules. That you can access various databases, files. You can do stuff in Spark. You can reach out to Python R and many other open source libraries. All of this can be used in deployment as well, all of these modules. And then, of course, that makes the feedback cycle extremely efficient. The moment your business analyst says this analysis doesn't quite fit, maybe you should include some other data or do this slightly differently, or why aren't you using deep learning? The data scientists can go back, refine their workflow, and by the click of a button, once they execute it, this new revised workflow will be put into production, which, of course, also allows me to have built-in testing and fully automate and complete this deployment cycle. And on a little side note, this, of course, enables all of these things like model ops. It allows for complete governance and compliance with all of the workflows that you're doing, because everything that's happening can automatically be versioned, and it's all within the same framework. So is this available now? You can already start with these workflow capture and deploy nodes. It's available in our Nike build, and we're going to release this officially in summer 2020. And then, of course, with that comes a lot of blueprints on the NIME Hub that you can use as a starting point as an example how to use this. But in addition to that, we'll also be starting to release complete, but, and that's important, all these customizable solutions. So it's something where you say, okay, for churn prediction, here's a way to do this. But if you want to use slightly different data or you have your different preferences for the models, you can take this solution, which is a NIME workflow in the end, and adjust it any way you want. Right. If we do that, we will provide some of these solutions. Some will come from the community, and maybe some of those will come from you. Thank you very much.